Amen, amen, amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his wonderful benefits. It is a blessing once more and again from the great God of heaven that he has blessed us with this opportunity that we are to gather together, the people of God, gather together in the house of God for the purpose of worshiping God, hearing a word from God, so that when I go, I can represent God. How's that sound? Amen. Amen. So good to see all of you that have come back out on this afternoon. Don't worry. I know the Super Bowl is coming on. I know that you ordered your wings that you got to pick them up by a certain time. So I know you're watching. I know. I know. I am aware of what is going on. So I'm going to give you the five B's today. All right. That's be brief, brother. Be brief. Amen. 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 Galatians chapter two and verse number 20, if you would. Galatians chapter two. And verse number 20, we've had an awesome time in the, in the Word of God all day on today. It's just so good that the Word of God is, is good. Sometimes it gives you a mirror to look in. And, and you can see as to what in my life is not lining up with what God's Word says. And you know, you know that's not a bad thing. You know, that's actually a good thing. It is a good thing to recognize you're wrong. So that you're able to correct yourself and now you're able to do that thing which is right. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. The Bible says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in God who loved me and gave himself for me. Our, our message on this afternoon, simply put, is learning to be more like Jesus. Learning to be more like Jesus. That's an easy thing to say, right? Not, not really an easy thing for us to do. Le learning to be Christ-like, learning to live more like Jesus can be challenging for each and every single one of us. Yes. Whether you're a young person, whether you're a middle-aged person, whether you're an older-aged person, it is a difficult thing for you to become more Christ-like. It is, it is more difficult because it will, make, it, will, it will cause us to have to come in confrontation with some challenges in our lives as to whether or not we can see, okay, God is not pleased with this. This is not where I need to be. So it causes us to bring about correction in our lives and it calls us to rearrange some things oftentimes like you go in your living room it's like okay I don't like the way this thing is looking so I'm gonna take this sofa and I'm gonna move it over here I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna move it over here I'm gonna rearrange something and I don't know about y'all but I'm glad that every now and then God just decides to come and just rearrange some things in my life because if we're not careful we'll get comfortable where we are and we see no need to change things the way that they are we see man it's all right it's been like that since mama was living it's been like that since big mama was alive I'm not going to change it I'm not going to do anything with it but it's so good that every now and then God will come and he will rearrange some things in our life in order to wake us up in order to stir us up and to get us busy and moving and active in the kingdom of God now anytime you feel like growing anytime you feel like becoming a stronger child of God anytime you desire to become more Christ like you need to remind yourself that you have committed to serve God for what he has done through his son and that your life belongs to him and it is your duty to live for Christ and to be a light set up on a hill that cannot be hidden. So now at, at first many of those that followed Jesus y'all remember they did so because he simply invited them to come and to follow him and so many of them they left their jobs. They left their homes, they left everything to go and to follow Jesus. And, and these men didn't have any idea about what was going to happen. They didn't have any idea about the impact that the decision would end up having on their lives and how important they would become in influencing others to come and to follow this Jesus that they had found as well. Now, you remember as Jesus started gathering more disciples, they had the privilege to see the master at work as he healed people, as he opened blinded eyes, as he unstopped ears that were deaf, and as he took two sardines and five little barley loaves and fed 5,000 hungry men and women. And, and all of those things they were able to see him do. And in Matthew chapter 8, beginning at verse number 23, down to verse number 27, it says, Now, when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. 
And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with waves. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us because we are perishing. But he said to them, why are you fearful? O ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm, so that the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the seas obey his voice? Now, now several of these disciples that were with him were experienced fishermen. I mean, they had been fishing all their life. This is what they did for a living, and they knew how dangerous the water could be. And these men became afraid. These men got scared. And I can imagine what was going through their mind when they saw Jesus down there asleep. Man, we up here fearing for our lives. We don't know if we're going to make it. We don't know if we're going to survive it. Jesus is at the bottom of the boat, and he is sleeping like a baby through everything that is going on. They didn't waste any time waking him up because of their fear, and they looked at him for salvation. They looked at him to be saved. And then Jesus points out how weak their faith was at this point, and then he calms the storm, and the disciples are amazed. Oh, how did that happen? Apparently, they forgot who was on the boat. Now, the same thing happens to many of us, the children of God today. Things happen in this life that will cause you to have great fear in your own life. Because you have not, because you have not learned to have enough trust in God, nor have you fully grasped what Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28. And we guess. No, we know. That somebody been in Sunday school, and we know <laughs> that all things work together for the good of those that love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, let me tell you something. God can take any situation that may arise in your life and make something good come out of it. I say God can cause any circumstance, any situation that arises in your life, and God can make some good come out of it one way or another. And when we see God working in our lives and the results that come from it, we just stand in awe, just like Jesus said, man, you a bad God, man. You done showed out one more time. Any of y'all ever had any experiences like that to where God just showed up and did something in your life, and, and he did it in such a way that you couldn't give yourself credit, even though you wanted to take the credit. You couldn't give nobody else credit. You just had to stand there and say, man, you bad, you know. I see you, I know, I know you're working because I asked such and such to do it and they couldn't do anything else for me. I tried everything that I could do and I couldn't do anything about it and I just had to steal away and depend on Jesus and he was able to deliver me and to give me the answer that I was looking for. Now, another difficulty that faces us is staying committed to God when things get tough. Yeah. Staying committed to God when you don't fully understand what God is doing. Yeah. It's an easy thing when your car full of gas, yeah. your light bill is paid, you ain't behind, you got your, dep- your direct deposit hitting every Friday like clockwork. You ain't worried. You ain't missing that. You ain't missing no meals. Everything good. It is easy for you to go around and tell people, I got faith. I love God. Oh, I fear God. I, I'm serving him. But then when the tire hit the road. And you are actually put in a situation to where your faith has to be tested. Your faith has to be put to limit. Oh, Lord, why would you bring me here? Lord, why would you, why would you allow me to go through this? A lot of things that you don't really have to go through is really meant for you to grow through. Now, John, John chapter 6 and verse number 67 says, Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And I feel like the people that are looking at me right now and here have the same testimony as these people. You recognize, you have come to know that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So when you are faced with adversity, when you are faced with these difficulties, why do we so soon forget that? 
Why do we so soon forget that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God? And if he is that person, he has the ability to help me with whatever I'm facing in this life. Now, these are truly words spoken by somebody who understands that Jesus had the word of eternal life. Not only did he have the word of eternal life, guess what? He was the word of eternal life. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and came down and dwelt among us, and we beheld him as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He was the living word. Now, as time went on, Y'all remember Jesus' three best friends. Who were they? They were Peter, James, and John. You know, his ace boon and his coon. You know, Peter, James, and John. They were eyewitnesses of Jesus as he was up on the mountain of transfiguration. And you remember they were up there, had a glorious occasion, had a glorious experience. Peter got up there, just looked around. Peter got so excited, he said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us build three tabernacles. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for thee. But he didn't recognize that God only had one in whom he had sent to be the redeemer. Now, now Moses was a good man, but he had some issues. Elijah was a good man, but he had some issues. There was only one that came and walked this world, did not lie, did no wrong, no guile, was found in his mouth. There was only one that was worthy to pay the price, to pay the ransom for your sin. He had to find some blood that was sinless, and that was found in Jesus. Now, the Bible says in Luke chapter 9 and verse number 37, it says, Now, it happened on the next day. This is after they came off the mountain of transfiguration. Now, it happened when they came down off the mountain that a great multitude met them. Suddenly, a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast him out, but they could not. In other words, I brought him to church folk. <laughs> and they couldn't do anything about it. And I want to put you on notice, stop coming to church folk with your problem. And come to Jesus with your problem. That's our, that's our issue. Too many people are invested in the folk. And not invested in Jesus. So when the folk treat you wrong, you run off and you leave. But if you got Jesus, man, let the wind blow, let the rain fall, let come what may. I'm going to stay with Jesus because he has the words of eternal life. Said, then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear you? Bring your son here. In other words, let me show you how to do this thing. <laughs> and as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. Now look at that. Jesus on the mountain. Just had a mountaintop experience. But isn't it funny that just as soon as he come off the mountain, he got to deal with the demon that has possessed a young boy? What are you saying, preacher? Don't get so used to being on the mountaintop that you don't know how to survive in the valley. Too many of us as Christians, we think that Christianity is all about the mountaintop. Christianity is all about things being on the up and up. Let me tell you, Christianity got some valleys. It got some ditches every now and then. It got some trenches every now and then. And every now and then, you need to be ready to deal with what's at the bottom of the mountain. Because you're not always going to be up. Can you testify with that? that everything is not going to always be going in your face. You're not going to always have it your way. You're going to have to deal with some things that you really don't want to deal with. Now, once again, we have an instance where Jesus' disciples' faith was weak. Now, you just imagine, these people spending all this time with Jesus, eating with Jesus, sleeping in the same space with Jesus, walking with Jesus, having every opportunity to figure out who they were, what their purpose was, what God had them for, and their faith was still weak. 
Seen the man heal folk, seen the man raise folk, and your faith is still weak. God has made a way for you time and time and time again, yet your faith is still not at the place to where it needs to be. Another thing that some people battle with as they grow as, as Christians, and something that we really got to get rid of, so five-letter word called pride. And you can see this in Jesus' disciples. In Luke chapter 9, verses 46 through 48, as he said, Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be the greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thought in the heart, Jesus, see, that's the thing I love about God. Before you can even get it out your mouth, he know what you was thinking. Before you can even conjure up the words, he saw you think, he saw him coming from this way. That he already knows what it's going to be. And the Bible says, and Jesus, perceiving of their, the thought of their heart, took a little child and sat by them and said to them, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you will be great. Now at this point, Jesus' disciples were looking at their discipleship, they were looking at their call as a contest. Mm -hmm. I gotta outdo you. Right. I gotta get ahead of you. Mm -hmm. I, I gotta be better than you. They were looking at it as some kind of contest, as if they were trying to beat each other, as if they were trying to do better than somebody else. And this is the wrong attitude to have as a child of God. Yeah. We should never be in some competition to see who's the greatest Christian. Because everybody messing up at some point. Ain't nobody no better than the next person. We all in the same basket, all in the same bed. We all sinners saved by the grace of God. And we all, we all just one note away from God calling us home. Some Christians do this by comparing themselves to other Christians. And the only reason I can see that a person would do this is so they can try to make themselves feel better or how much better they are than somebody else. But that's no way for us to be. Christians who do this remind me of the story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. It says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you. That I'm not like other men. See, throw a shade at the man in his prayer. Talking about somebody in his prayer. Jesus said, yeah, God, I thank you that I'm not, that I'm not like other men. I got the shade room here in Luke. Like, man, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Extortioners. Unjust. Cause he calling out the other folks the adulterers. Or even this tax collector. Well, at least he said it while the man was there. He can't, can't say it, he said it behind his back. I fast twice a week, night, 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 buffing, night. Yeah, yeah, he talking about himself. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of everything that I possess. And the tax collector. Now look what I do, but look at him. Standing afar off would not so much raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. One proud and haughty, glad to tell people about what he's doing. But the other one, Lord, I know I am not worthy to be even called your child. Lord, I know everything that I have is only because of you. Save me a sinner. Verse 14, he says, I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone, here it is, who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, 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 if we are not careful, we can get caught up in this game of seeing who is the greatest by comparing ourselves. But you got to learn to get beyond that kind of thinking and realize we are all servants of God. And we should not worry about how much or little someone else is doing but instead, we should focus in on what are we doing to make sure that we can make heaven our home. Yeah. Now, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 says this. It says, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, 
being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you. That was also in Jesus Christ. Jesus was not looking out for himself. He was looking out for the people. He says, let this mind be in you. That was also in Christ Jesus. So the Bible says, another thing finally that we struggle with as we learn to be Christ-like is to have mercy on other people. Especially somebody that did you wrong. I mean, man, oh, man, next time I see you, man, you know what? I buried the hatchet, but I got the hammer sticking out the ground. You know, and I, I'm just waiting on the opportunity. I'm waiting on you to look at me crazy. I'm waiting on you to say something. I'm waiting on you not to like my post. I'm waiting on you not to share this. I'm waiting on you to do something that I don't like so I can go back and I can, <laughs> and I can pull it right back up again. Now, Luke chapter 9 and verse 51, down to verse 56 says, Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go toward Jerusalem, and sent messages before his face, and as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare him. But they did not receive him, because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them like Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now in this instance, the Samaritans... You know, they didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus and, and James and, and John. And they wanted to go straight for the jugular vein. They was coming. And they said, you know what? Let's cast down five men. You remember, you remember how Elijah did them? Let's do them that very same way. But Jesus lets them know that this should not be their attitude. Because he came to save people's souls and not to put them to death. The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Can I tell you, everybody got an opportunity. Can I tell you, everybody has a chance to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody has an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. But the thing is, you got to do it of your own volition. You got to make the decision to follow Christ. You got to make the decision to do what God. Man, you folk can tell, and you know, it's, it's almost like something, you know, when you was a child. I don't know if you experienced this, but you know, you, you didn't have a choice on whether or not you can go to church. You just know when you get up Sunday morning, we're going to church. You already, no matter how you was feeling, you, you're just going to church. Man, then, then I don't know about y'all, but I'm, I'm going to just talk about Peterson. Then you go to college, and, and, and mama and them ain't around, they're about to tell you, you go to church. So whenever you had an opportunity, you know, you go to Bedside Baptist, you know. <laughs> Chilling out, max and relaxing, cool, you know. <laughs> you, 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 take, you take that opportunity because, you know, you, you, you making me feel like you making me go. But when I get the opportunity to actually do what I want to do, I'm not going to go. God ain't making you do anything. He said, whosoever will, if you have the desire, it's not, 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 not if your neighbor wants you to come up, not if your friend has pushed you up to do something, but if you within your heart recognize that you have heard, as it was on the day of Pentecost, when Peter got through preaching to them folk, they recognized, man, that, that, that's some truth to what that man talking right there. I ain't never heard nothing like this man is teaching us. And, 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 and it pricked them in such a way, it said it pricked their heart. Meaning it got to their mind. They were convinced of what they heard. They said, man, what we got to do? What do we have to do to change our condition? What do we have to do to better ourselves? And we know what that answer was. And that answer is the same for men and women alike today. I don't know about y'all, but this is my daily prayer. Lord, help me to be better today than I was on yesterday. 
Lord, I know I'm not going to get it all right today. I know I'm going to mess something up along the way. But Lord, let me learn from it. Lord, Lord, don't just allow me to just be making fall after fall after fall and fall and not be filling up my notebook. Don't, don't, don't allow me to be going through all of this stuff and not learning from the things that I've been dealt, not learning from those things that I've gone through. So when I come against it another time, man, I've seen this before. I know, I know how to handle this devil. I know, I know how to handle that drug. I've been through this before. I saw God bring me through it before. And if he brought me through it before, I know he's able to do it for me again so I got to put my faith in him I got to put my faith in him and children of God we'll never learn how to be like Christ if we don't never look at the words of Christ you will never learn to be like Christ unless you look at the words of Christ we got to study the word of God we got to be in tune with the word of God you know he talks about um, the, the, the writer talks about he depicts the armor that we ought to take up how we ought to have the shield and we got to have the sword to be able to fight with because do you know whether or not you realize that every day you go on the war you had war on the job. You had war at the house. You had war in relationships. Everywhere we go, we are at war. Our adversary, he ain't taking no, 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 no breaks. He ain't, he ain't giving no leeway. He is after you. He is on the job. So we have to be ready. We have to be ready to do it. And let me tell you, we, we, we don't know where it's coming from. We just know it's coming. Man, you all going on about your way. And somebody call you with something, man, it just changed your whole entire mood for the day. Man, you woke up, had a smile on your face. Man, it's going to be a good day today. You know what? Like, like Ice Cube said, today was a good day. Man, you, Lord, it, it's going to be a good day today. I'm going to have fun today. And then somebody come and just throw a monkey wrench out there. And you just downhill for the day. When you have true joy in Jesus Christ, no matter what happens, you keep a smile on your face. No matter what you experience, you can be in the valley of despair, still saying, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mind. You can be like Daniel in a lion's den. Man, lion, get out of my way, man. You ain't, man, move, move over, man. Lay down. I need a pillow. You come over here. I need something to keep me warm. You can be in the fiery furnace of life. Man, man just imagine the people that threw you in burned up before they can even get to the door. But you are not only allowed to make it in, but you're down there walk, taking a stroll in a fiery furnace. Can you come say, man, did we not throw three men in the fiery furnace? And lo, I see four, and then the fourth man looked like the son of God. Let me tell you, sometimes folk wonder, they're, they're in amazement at how you're able to go through and deal with the things that you deal with and able to come out with a smile on your face. Man, you must not have seen the other man that was with me. You must not have seen the one. Because, you know, if you're really looking at me right now, you think I'm standing, but I'm not standing by myself. It's really God that's holding me up. It's really God that's sustaining me because how I feel sometimes, I want to faint. I want to throw in the towel. I want to give up. But when I almost fell, he picked me up and he sustained me and he brought me back. He is the one that can pick you up up church out of the miry clay place your feet on solid ground and then establish your goings bless in the city bless in the field bless going out and bless coming in that's that's the kind of life that I want to live but I'll only get it when I learn to be like Christ learn it to be like Christ that when you're ridiculed and when you're talked about you're not so quick to respond because you realize, hey, if I'm being talked about, I'm in good company. Because they talked about Jesus. So guess what? I know they're going to talk. If they lied on Jesus, they're going to lie on you. Even though you know in a bit of truth in it, they're going to they gonna, they gonna lie on you. Satan is going to do any and everything that he can to discourage you in your walk with God. He will do any and everything that he can. He will make you stub every single one of your toes on Sunday morning just so you can get a bad attitude and say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm just not going to church, you know. My toe hurts, you know. Oh, man, I did my, my hair as a mess, you know what. Uh, you know, I, I'm just not going to go today. I just, just can't do it, just can't go looking like He will give you any and every excuse that you want to find not to do what you're supposed to do. But no excuse is good enough. You've been called to serve God. When you decided to be a Christian, you enlisted in the army of Christ. 
He gave you your he gave you your your orders. He told you to go out, tell somebody about my gospel. Go out, preach and teach my word to those. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be dead. We got to continue to go out there. We and, and I know we, we, uh, we we're still trying to see okay where we're gonna go. But no matter whether it's regular times or whether it's COVID times, soul need to be saved. Whether it's COVID times or whether it's neg or whether it's regular times, people need to hear about Jesus. People need to hear that He lived, that He died on the third day, he rose again with all power in His hand. And if they would but put their faith in Him, surrender their life to Him, be buried with Him in baptism, they can have a new life and have the opportunity to live with Him forever in heaven Amen. that's what we're put here for we got to go out and help somebody else recognize who he is so my brother and my sister maybe you're here today and you say preacher you know what I want to be more like Jesus but I got X Y I got Z I don't know how to deal with it will you pray for me we'll be glad to have that opportunity to pray with you today if you have certain things that are keeping you from being all of who Christ desires for you to be, maybe you're here or maybe you're watching um, via live stream here with us tonight and you don't yet know the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're not a member of the body of Christ, which is the church of Christ. You come out hearing this word, believing the same, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ as your Savior, being buried with him in baptism, have your sins washed away, come up to walk in newness of life. Think about it. All things have passed away, and all things have become new. God will give you a new, and he'll give you a clean start. And every step of the way, no matter how hard things get, you got somebody that's walking with you. Yeah. He's holding your hand. He's ready, willing, and able. If you would, but cast yourself on him. Guess what? He's going to catch you. He's not going to let you fall. He's going to lift you up. He'll sustain you, and he'll give you what you need to be able to overcome. If you're here today, maybe you're subject to the invitation. Don't put off today what you plan on doing tomorrow. Come now. It's together we stand and sing the song of invitation.